characteristic functions are an important tool for understanding the sum of random variables. So RVs is not recreational vehicles, it's random variables. In fact, we should introduce a little bit of notation at this point. Statisticians often use the convention that a capital letter represents a random variable and the corresponding lowercase letter represents the value of that variable. The distribution of a variable is written P sub capital X of little x. It's not a very good font for showing that here because it's the distribution of the variable as a function of the particular value that you're interested in. So now to characteristic functions. The characteristic function of a univariate distribution is no more nor less than exactly its Fourier transform. If you recall, you can take any function of x, but now we're going to use p sub x of x, and its Fourier transform is defined as the integral of it times e to the i t x, so x, the variable here, is the same as the variable here, and the transform itself is a function of this other variable here called t, which then appears on the left-hand side. The characteristic function of a probability distribution for capital X is written phi sub x of t. What is the value of the characteristic function phi sub x at 0? Well, let's see. We put t equals 0 into this exponential. That means it's 1, and we just get the integral of the distribution, and that must be 1. So we've learned something that's universal to all characteristic functions. Let's try taking a derivative with respect to the variable t. So to take a derivative here, t doesn't occur in the limits, t does occur here, so the derivative with respect to t will bring down an i x into the function, but now we're going to set t equals 0, so it's going to be just an integral of i x times p x of x dx, and you can see except for this i, that's simply the first moment or mean of the random variable x. Similarly, if we take two derivatives with respect to t, we'll bring down an ix squared, which is a minus, I've put it over on the left-hand side, x squared, and we see that the second derivative of the characteristic function, evaluated at 0, is just the uncentered second moment of the distribution px of x. That is to say, it's the variance of x, which is the centered second moment, plus this extra piece that you would need to uncenter it. So you can keep repeating this and you'll see that the coefficients of the Taylor series expansion of the characteristic function, that is to say the successive derivatives evaluated at 0, are, except for some factors of i and maybe some factorials that are going to come in, equal to the uncentered moments. Here's the key theorem that makes characteristic functions important. The characteristic function of the sum of independent random variables is the product of their individual characteristic functions. In other words, suppose that we have a new random variable s, which is the sum of two random variables x and y, which are assumed to be independent then what do we know about the probability distribution of the sum? That is to say in this notation P sub capital S of little s. Well we can work it out using the laws of probability as follows. Suppose there's some value u and we know the probability of x taking on that value u. Similarly suppose that we know the probability of y taking on the value of s minus u. Well then x plus y will be s as desired and since x and y are independent probabilities by hypothesis the, the joint probability is simply the product of those two probabilities. But not quite. 
because u was an arbitrary value. We need to marginalize. We're interested in the total probability of little s independent of what this value of u was, so we integrate over u by the usual law of probabilities marginalization. Now what this theorem says is that rather than do this complicated convolution integral, which is what this is called, if we know the characteristic function of x and of y, we just have to multiply them together as simple functions of t, and that will be the characteristic function of s, again, as a function of t. How do we prove this theorem? Well, if you know the Fourier convolution theorem, there's nothing to prove, because the fact that this implies this is exactly the Fourier convolution theorem. But I'm going to suppose that you've never run across the Fourier convolution theorem before, so let's actually prove that theorem using this notation. Here's the proof. We start with a Fourier transform pair. This one is simply the definition of the characteristic function of x, and what you have to know from the theory of Fourier transforms is that this is an invertible transform, and you can, from phi x of t, recover px of x by doing this inverse transform. The inverse transform has an e to the minus t times x here in the exponent, and then it also has to have to come out with the right normalization of 1 over 2 pi. So this implies this simply because they're Fourier transform pairs. Now here's the proof. The probability distribution of s as a function of s is the convolution as we explained on the previous page. Now for py of this argument, let's just substitute the inverse Fourier formula here. So you'll see we therefore get a phi y of t and an e to the minus i t and then we have to put the argument in right here so that's the s minus u that goes here. Now that standard trick beloved of proofs like this we simply interchange the order of integration and rearrange some of the factors. So I'm going to bring the phi y out here uh, it doesn't depend on u, so I can bring it out through the u integral. Anyway, you can see how um, basically I've just rearranged things, and the inner integral that I have to do over u is now this integral. But we look back up here at the definition of the inverse of the characteristic function, and we see that this is nothing more than the characteristic function of x. So we've proved that ps of s is this thing on the product of phi y and phi x. But what is this thing? This thing is just an inverse Fourier transform by itself. You can look up here to see that. So therefore that completes the proof. We've proved that the characteristic function of s is equal to the product of the two characteristic functions. Another piece that we need to discuss is how random variables scale. What do I mean by that? Let's suppose that we're given some random variable p sub capital X of little x and that it has the shape of this blue curve that I've rather crudely sketched here. What is the probability distribution of a different quantity three times x? Well, if this is centered around one then p of 3 times x obviously has to be centered around 3. In fact, if you think about it for just a second, you'll see that it's got to be the same functional shape, however, stretched by a factor of 3. But these are probability distributions, so therefore, to keep the area equal to 1, it also has to be shrunk by a factor of 3 in this direction. So that's how random variables scale. How do characteristic functions scale? Well, we're going to use this picture. Suppose we want to know the characteristic function not of the random variable x, but of the random variable a times x. So the definition of that is it's the Fourier transform of the probability of a times x as a function of x times dx. Now, this underlined piece is equal to this underlined piece why? Because it's basically the picture up here. 
Suppose a is 3. It says that we have to change the argument by a factor of 3 to scale back down to the blue curve. So we would divide whatever variable we have, whatever value of x we have, by 3. And then we have to fix the normalization by also dividing by 3 here. Well, now we're almost done, because if you look at this for a while, you'll see that basically there's just a new variable floating around, which is x divided by a, because here and here are a dx divided by a. And now in the exponential, we just have to multiply and divide by a so that this becomes an x divided by a, and then we have an at here. And now this integral is the integral over this new dummy variable dx over a. I could replace that by another letter, but I didn't want to confuse you. And you'll see we basically just have a characteristic function again. But its argument is no longer t. Its argument is now a times t. So we've shown that the characteristic function of ax is equal to the characteristic function of x, but with an a tacked on to the argument t of that characteristic function. A shorter way of saying that is characteristic functions let you take a constant outside here in the subscript and move it inside to the argument there, and that's their scaling law. What's the characteristic function of a Gaussian, for example, that is to say of the normal distribution? Well, it's a Fourier transform. We can just work it out in Mathematica. So let's do that. Um, here's a piece of Mathematica we met before, but now I'm going to formalize again. Often when we have something like a standard deviation, we have to tell Mathematica that it's going to be positive. And the way to do that once and for all is you add to this hidden variable assumptions, the logical construct, and then the assumption that you want. Here the assumption is going to be sig is greater than zero. If you don't do that, then whenever you try to take a square root of sig squared, Mathematica divides into cases as to whether that should be plus or whether that should be minus, and you get kind of a mess printed out for the answer. Okay, here we enter into Mathematica the expression for the normal distribution. I hope you all have memorized this by now. Remember the minus a half inside the exponent, and remember the 1 over the square root of 2 pi and the 1 over sigma in the normalization. Here it is written out a little bit better. Let's check that we've entered it correctly by integrating it from minus infinity to plus infinity, and Mathematica indeed tells us uh, that we get 1 as we expect. Now what we really came for here is to integrate p times e to the i t x from minus infinity to plus infinity. Mathematica uses the reserved symbol capital I for the square root of minus 1. No problem at all. It does the integral and you get this expression. Let's write it out. What we see is that the characteristic function of a normal distribution is itself a kind of a normal distribution phi sub normal of t is e to the, let's look at this term first, minus a half sigma squared t squared. Well, if this had been minus a half t squared over sigma squared, that would essentially have been, except for a shift, the original normal distribution. So you see the characteristic function basically takes the standard deviation that was in the, uh, the denominator or I should say the variance, the square of the standard deviation, and moves it to the numerator. Then there's also this factor, which rotates around the complex plane according to the value of mu, which is necessary to translate the variable by the value of the mean mu. Okay, that's pretty interesting. We're going to come back to that when we prove the central limit theorem. Let's do another characteristic function. What's the characteristic function of the Cauchy distribution? You'll recall that the Cauchy distribution is the example that we always like to use as a problem child because it doesn't even have a mean or a variance. But it has a perfectly good characteristic function, as we'll see. Recall that its probability distribution goes down as 1 over 1 plus, again, this square of x minus the central value divided by the width 
Notice I'm trying to be a little bit careful not to call this the mean and the standard deviation because they're not. Well, I tried to do this in Mathematica, and then I tried to do it in MATLAB, and sadly both of them fail at computing the Fourier integral of this function. So we'll have to use old-fashioned methods, wetware methods. Do you know what wetware is? Wetware means using your brains. And if you do that, you'll have to dig out a textbook on complex variable theory and look at contour integrals or something like that. It will tell you that the Fourier transform is this function. Once again we get an e to the i mu t that's just a rotating term in the complex plane that indicates what the value of mu is and now instead of a Gaussian here, instead of a normal here we get e to the minus sigma times the absolute value of t. Notice that that's non-adalytic at t equals zero. There's no derivative for example at t equals zero. Well, do you remember that the derivative of the characteristic function was a moment and the second derivative was a second moment? Now we see how you can have a characteristic function but not have moments. It's because there has to be a non-analyticity at t equals zero to prevent those moments from existing. So it all works out. By the way, if you're not willing to do this integral by wetware methods, you can also do it by social networking. My version of social networking is to send an email to my longtime co-author Saul and say, Saul, how do I do this integral? And Saul writes back and says, if t is greater than zero, you close the contour in the upper half plane in a big semicircle, which adds nothing. So the integral is just the residue of the pole, given here, which gives e to the minus sigma t. Similarly, you close the contour in the lower half plane if t is less than zero, giving e to the plus sigma t. And you can put those together by just saying that the answer is e to the minus absolute value of sigma t. So now you see how an absolute value can come out of doing an integral. The integral really has two separate cases of convergence. And if you do them each separately, you then put it together to be an absolute value.